January 5th, 1996, Bet Lahia Village, Gaza Strip. It is the most intense manhunt in Israeli history. 27-year-old Palestinian Ikia Ayash, a.k.a. The Engineer, has been responsible for the deaths of over 100 men, women, and children. In one of the most secret operations ever conducted, the Israelis will mount an audacious and brutal plan of retribution. Arrest orders are superseded. The Engineer is now targeted for death. The Jewish state of Israel has been in bloody conflict with the Palestinians and its Arab neighbors ever since its creation in 1948. War in the cradle of three of the world's great religions captures the intense scrutiny of Western media. In 1988, I came to uh, Israel to cover the first Intifada, which was a sort of general uprising in the occupied territories against the uh, Jewish authorities. Best-selling author Mark Bowden followed the conflict in Israel as a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Just about every day, there would be groups of uh, uh, Palestinian kids who would organize, in some cases, a large organized demonstration and attack Israeli forces with stones. They'd be fired on by rubber bullets and tear gas and sometimes worse. In the violently charged atmosphere of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, the Islamic resistance movement known as Hamas thrives under the leadership of their spiritual guide, the quadriplegic Sheikh Ahmed Yassin. Hamas is a fundamentalist Islamic organization within the occupied territories that uh, began as a social network to provide social services and to set up Islamic schools for children in the West Bank and Gaza but has a uh, very uh, militant arm. Dr. Mahmoud al-Zahar is the Hamas political delegate in the Gaza Strip. Our aim is not only to liberate our land, but also our aim is to establish a pan-Islamic state which is controlled by Islam. Actually, Israel is a foreign body, and medically, foreign body is not accepted. To oust this foreign body from Palestinian soil, Hamas promotes grassroots resistance by any available means. To keep the aggression in check, Israel relies on their elite counter-terrorist and espionage force known as the Shin Bet. Shin Bet is the internal Israeli security force, equivalent to the FBI in the United States. Ronnie Shaked spent 12 years investigating Hamas as an agent for the Shin Bet. When the first Intifada started, the Hamas people knew that this is the time that they have to change, to go up a little bit, upgrade their work to make jihad. Jihad, it means to start to fight in all means, not just by praying, not just by breaking in, in, in the mosque, but to take weapon in the hand and to fight against the Jewish, the Israeli, the enemy. Palestinian children in the occupied territories are raised in a climate charged with a call for defiance. A young student from the West Bank town of Rafah would grow up to be their most powerful weapon. A devout Muslim, Ikea Ayash had grown up in a society fueled by hatred and revenge towards Israel. At the age of 19, he is accepted to the university in the West Bank town of Ramallah. And in the university, he started studying engineering, and he graduated from Birzet University. Soon married and with a new son, Ayash wants to provide for his family away from the oppressive environment of the West Bank. He tried to go out to continue his studies in Jordan, but uh, the Israeli people, I don't know what was the reason, they didn't give him permission to go outside of the country. Denied by Israeli authorities and trapped in the poverty-stricken town of Rafat, Ayash begins to seek revenge. He was studying how to build bombs. In the Palestinian territories, word of a talented engineering student soon spreads. Hamas is eager to recruit those with the potential to raise the level of their fight. They had enough people to take a Kalashnikov or to take a weapon in his hand and to go and shoot on the Jewish people. 
They need engineer, real engineer to work and to build the bombs. As the outside world pressures the region for peace, 27-year-old Ikea Ayash hones his skills as a bomb maker under the guidance of Hamas. Meanwhile, 6,500 miles away on October 13, 1993, a peace accord secretly negotiated in Oslo, Norway, is being signed to the United States. President Clinton staged a big signing ceremony for the accord, at which Rabin, who looked like he was about to uh, faint with uh, uh, distaste, was leaned over and tentatively shook the hand of Yasser Arafat. It was a, an historic photograph. For thousands of grateful Israelis and Palestinians, the Accords are the first step towards a peaceful coexistence. For many others, however, an Accord for Peace would ignite nothing but fury. This is injustice, will not convince anybody, will not satisfy our people. What about the right of return? The agreement rejects the right of thousands of displaced Palestinians to return to their homeland. Hamas will not budge from its stated goal, the total destruction of Israel. But there are many Israelis who also oppose any notion of peace with the Palestinians. Israel itself has radical religious factions and right-wing factions, and these people would regard any gestures toward conciliation with the PLO to be betrayal of the state of Israel. With the Oslo Accords less than six months old, nobody could predict the actions of one Brooklyn-born physician. It was the 25th of February, 1994, in a very cold day in Hebron, 5.30 in the morning. He went into the cave of the Machpelah, that's the, one of the most holy, most holy synagogue for the Jewish people. And while the Muslims were praying there, he shoot them in the back. A man wielding an assault rifle fires 110 rounds before a mob stops him, bludgeoning him to death with a fire extinguisher. Dr. Baruch Goldstein, a fanatical right-wing Jew from a nearby Israeli settlement, had killed 29 Palestinians and seriously wounded 70 others. As word of the massacre spreads, angry mobs begin to form around the mosque. Israeli soldiers, fearing for their own lives, fire into the crowds. It was a terrible shock to all the people, especially to Hamas people. If you are going to kill the Palestinian civilian, you have to expect that you are going to drink from the same poison. An American Jew had given Hamas its motivation to strike at the heart of Israel. After that massacre, it is allowed for everybody to attack any Israeli citizen or military. Jihad is waged, and now all of Israel is fair game. Ikia Ayash prepares to heed the call. With scores of young zealots ready to volunteer for martyrdom, Ayash has developed a series of sophisticated and deadly suicide bombs. He did it slowly, slowly in his house. He knew how to build it, and he knew how to build a car bomb. Hamas would soon have its revenge. The revenge was in Afula in the April 6, 1994. 19-year-old Raid Zakarna volunteers for the mission. Seeking a target, he enters the Israeli town of Afula. His car has been rigged by the engineer with 50 pounds of explosives. April 6, 1994. 19-year-old Palestinian Raid Zakarna is about to make his bid for martyrdom in the fight against Israel. He drives his explosive rigged car into the Israeli town of Afula. Zakarna had detonated himself next to a bus full of passengers, killing nine. A group called the Izzedine al Qassam Brigade takes responsibility for the suicide bombing. Izzedine al Qassam is the military wing of Hamas. They built some kind of branches, organization, political, and also the military branch. 
the Shin Bet pressures their informants for information. Their investigation reveals an association between the Izzedine Al Qassam Brigade and a mysterious young engineering student. And then we heard the name of Yehi Ayash, the man who prepared the bomb. Seven days later, on April 13th in the town of Hadira, Ayash strikes again. A suicide bomber with a bag of explosives detonates himself inside a city bus. Israel found itself under severe suicide attack in a period of time of one week. At that time, it was a very unique phenomenon. Again, the name of the young engineering student surfaces inside Israeli intelligence. Yehia Yash was the man who prepared the bomb. The suicide bombings are the first of their kind in Israel. Ayash has rewritten the rules. Yehia Yash was the mastermind of the uh, new phenomenon of suicide attacks. Ayash's strategy for terror is aimed directly at Israeli civilians. The idea that there is a guy that he's decisive and he uh, is ready to do anything, including killing himself, just in order to hurt you, this notion is frightening. Any society recoils with a lot more fear and horror when the victims of violence are, uh, are civilians, men, women, children, people going about their daily lives. As anxiety and fear spreads throughout Israel, the Shin Bet puts all their efforts into preventing the next attack. Gideon Ezra, deputy director of Israel's Shin Bet, is a lead investigator in the hunt for Ayash. He worked on it a lot of time, with a lot of people coordinating with the army, with the police. He was uh, wanted number one. With information tying Hamas and its bomb maker Ayash to the suicide attacks, the Shin Bet compiles names of anyone with links to Hamas. The Shin Bet part is number one to collect information. Ah! And this information you collect by all means that you can. As lead interrogator for the Shin Bet, Michael Kobe is feared by Palestinian militants. We arrested about 500 uh, members of the Hamas organization. We interrogated 250 approximately. The interrogations reveal Ikea Ayash is not just a bomb maker for Hamas, but a major player in the organization. Beginning of 1992, they upgrade him and put him as one of the commanders of the Ezzed Din al-Qassam, the military branch of Hamas. And we saw from act of terror to act of terror that he was more and more expert. For his record, it was hard to pronounce Arab names, so he said, let's call him the engineer. The man now known simply as the engineer is the most feared man in Israel. This is the man that we have to put all our efforts in order to know who is this man, why he is doing, and what is his background. The Israeli border patrol is put on high alert in neighborhoods Ayash is known to frequent. Yeah. A Hamas cell in Nablus is soon uncovered. With information extracted from arrested cell members, the Israeli security forces begin to close in. He was located in one of the places in the old city of Nablus, in the market, very close to uh, the middle of the city. Israeli forces immediately launch a raid in the old city. And we were very close to him. It's a very um, tiny area and um, he escaped into the people. As Ayash goes deep underground, Prime Minister Rabin puts added pressure on the Shin Bet to find him. With angry right-wing religious groups demonstrating on the streets of Israel, the bombings seriously threaten the peace process negotiated at Oslo. What the terrorists like to do by committing the terrorist attack is not specifically kill one person or three person or 3,000 person. They would like to create anxiety 
within the target society. Well, all the pressure came on the Prime Minister uh, Yitzhak Rabin. Yet Rabin remains undeterred and faithful to the Oslo Accords. On May 18th, Rabin completes the withdrawal of Israeli troops from Gaza. On July 1st, 1994, Chairman Yasser Arafat arrives in Gaza, victorious. With Gaza sealed and under the sole jurisdiction of the Palestinians, the Israelis must rely on the Palestinian Authority to track the engineer. We asked from the Palestinian Security Service to f find to find him to help to arrest them. Instead, Gaza becomes the perfect refuge for the engineer. It's an area which everyone knows everyone, and every stranger who comes in is suspicious straight away. An area where putting an undercover shin bed operative would be extremely risky. The shin bed shares their intelligence information with Rashid Abu Shabak from the Palestinian Authority in the hopes that their counterparts will cooperate in the hunt for the engineer. Rashid Abu Shabak is now at the head of the intelligence of the Palestinian Authority in Gaza Strip. Of course, it's not a secret that he is wanted to the Israeli intelligence. We are a newly established authority, and for the first time, the Palestinian people welcome the Palestinian Authority to govern them. Arresting Hamas is a priority for the Shin Bet, but not for the Palestinian Authority. We did not want to give the Palestinian people the impression that we are only here to arrest members of the Hamas. With no cooperation from the Palestinian Authority in the hunt for the engineer, Israelis brace themselves for the next attack. The people were asking where it's going to be the next time. Not, not when, but where. And that was very hard feeling. One of the engineer's biggest acts of revenge is about to come to Tel Aviv. October 19, 1994. With the terrorist bomb maker known as the Engineer on the run, Israel braces for the worst. Ikea Ayash plans a strike on a symbol of Israeli tranquility. Gizengov is the Fifth Avenue of Tel Aviv. And the center of the heart of the Tel Aviv people. A young Palestinian named Rahim al sawi volunteers for the Engineer's mission. First of all, he prepared the bomb slowly, slowly. And when he had a big bomb, he put it in a big bag, like a regular bag of the Israeli people. Then he take the men who volunteered to, to commit suicide. He took pictures of him. Then he took video camera, and he asked him to talk to his father, to his mother, to his nation, to his people, to the Jewish people, to, to, to tell them why he is going to commit suicide in Tel Aviv. And then in the next morning, Yechi Ayash himself take him to the bus to Tel Aviv. Inside Tel Aviv, the engineer selects a bus he's sure will be packed with Israeli commuters. He went to bus number five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't want that between the casualties will be Palestinians. He, want to be, he wanted to be sure it will be a bus with only Jews. And and when you are putting a bomb in a bus, the effect is much, much bigger. A bus like this is like a sealed can. Everybody that's in that space gets hurt. As bus number five passes a busy intersection on Dizengoff Street, Alsawi stands up in the center of the bus. And with one click of the switch, The explosion was in the center of the bus, the most deadly place, where the passengers get the most extreme damage to their bodies from the blast and pressure of the explosion. A big bomb and a lot of people were killed. It was a big shock for the Israeli people. This was a very, very serious act of terror against us. <laughs> The terrorist, almost all his body explodes. 
But because of the pressure of the bomb, usually his head is cut off and stays intact. And that's how we can identify the suicide bomber. Once again, the suicide bomber is linked to the engineer. Suddenly, in every place in Israel, they put guards, they put security people in the stores, in, even in the buses. It was not easy to live like this. It's a minute you are living without your freedom. Successful in his bid to terrorize Israeli society, the engineer becomes a Palestinian hero. Every small children, every, every man, in, old, old men in every village knew the name of the engineer. The Palestinian society needed hero in order to, to overcome the problems, in, over, in, in order to, to fight against the Israeli people. In an act almost unfathomable in other cultures, young Palestinians begin volunteering to decimate themselves with the engineer's suicide bombs. We talk about suicide attacks, but they don't see themselves as committing suicide. First of all, this is honorable things and blessed by every Arabic and every Muslim. Dr. Mahmoud Zahar, I think he was one of the first people that came with the concept of the suicide bombing in Israel. Israel as occupier is illegal, so by all means we are defending ourselves. If we have Apache F-16, and the same Israeli tanks, we are going to use these weapons against the military targets. But if we deeply, deeply poor in all methods to defend ourselves, I think every method used is justified by our religion. <laughs> The reason the 15 or 16 year old child makes himself a martyr is the daily scenes of Israeli acts against the Palestinian people. This is why they do this. For the suicide attacker, the act of martyrdom has its benefits. The family of the suicide attacker gets a huge sum of money, at least. In, in their perspective, a huge sum of money. Today it's about $25,000 for each suicide attacker. The suicide attacker believed that by committing the suicide attack, he reached paradise directly, one-way ticket. He gets to see the face of Allah, God. He gets the permission to uh, uh, bring 70 members of his family when daytime will come and they will die. The most important thing, he's going to have 72 virgins that will serve him in paradise. Though horrified by his handiwork, the Israeli forces can find no trace of the engineer. The Israeli security service get an order from its hacker bin himself. Go and bring this man. On the run, Ayash moves by night from safe house to safe house. Dirhi Ayash knew that he is under the microscope of the security service. The Shin Bet begins watching Ayash's family. His wife was living in the village, and he had to see his wife, to see his baby also. And he was coming from time to time, and many times, especially in 1994, the Israeli security service was just a few meters from him. After months of watching Ayash's house, the engineer finally appears. We knew that he was going to come to Rafa and we uh, were very uh, close to him uh, for nights. We were uh, located uh, just very close to his uh, house. When he came to uh, the house, I think we just missed him uh, minutes and uh, he escaped. Miraculously, the engineer slips away once again. Even after a wanted poster is published revealing Ayash's face, he still manages to pass through Israeli checkpoints. The picture we had didn't help us because enough that you put a beard, you put a mustache, and you look much older. And I am sure that many soldiers who knew the name Yichi Ayash met him, saw his identity card, they didn't believe that Yechi Ayash is next to him. Ayash becomes a master of disguise. 
masquerading as an old man, an Orthodox Jew, an Arab woman. He's dressed like regular men, or he's putting a kaffir on his head, or he's, fit, or he's putting a Jewish yarmulke on his, on his head. Every day and month, the engineer eludes the Israeli special forces. His fame grows among the Palestinians. And he knew that he is a symbol. He was reading the newspaper, hearing the news, watching television. Another extremist group, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, aligns with the engineer. January 22, 1995. A man wearing an Israeli army uniform approaches a crowd of soldiers at the Bet Lead Junction. As emergency crews descend on the scene, another soldier approaches the devastation. He reaches into his jacket and triggers a second device. 21 people, most of them soldiers, are killed. 62 others are injured. The Hamas and the Islamic Jihad will not succeed. For the Israeli security forces, the threat of another attack is always imminent. It was frustrating, not just for the Shin Bet, but also for the Prime Minister, Tzhak Rabin. Every meeting he was asked what's going to be with the engineer, how we are going to arrest him, how we are going to get rid of him, before he is going to put us another bomb here or there, or make people killed. Frustrated in the fight against terror, the Israeli special forces begin to consider a radical new approach. Terrorism is an act of war. And therefore, uh, killing the terrorists is an act of war as well, and a just act of war. For the Shin Bet, targeted killings would soon become the option of choice. Israel, 1995. Paralyzed by a string of devastating suicide bombings masterminded by the engineer, the Israeli Shin Bet decides it's time to resort to more extreme measures. Most of the bombers get the inspiration from the leaders, get the fatwa from the leaders. If we will kill the leaders, we can stop the bombers. August 20th, 1995, the Shin Bet captures one of the engineer's most trusted accomplices, 29-year-old Abdel Nasser Issa. Issa was caught in the middle of the street in, in Nablus by the Israeli security service, a very, very secret operation. Shin Bet interrogators beg their commander to allow them to use torture to persuade Issa to reveal what he knows about the engineer. In 90% of the investigation, the Israeli investigators don't use any part of power. Maybe in 10%, we can use a kind of power. Command refuses. Israel pays dearly for the decision. They didn't get the permission. Two days after the number 26 bus was bombed in Jerusalem, and young people were killed. The carnage convinces the Shin Bet commander to relent. After, of course, after the, the bomb was uh, exposed here and people were killed, he gave the order, go and put in physical pressure on him. Under torture, Issa reveals that he had delivered the bomb to an al qassam operative just hours before his arrest, with orders to pick a bus at random. Issa also reveals that Ayash had taught him and others how to make bombs. October 25th, 1995. Tension is high as Israeli forces withdraw from Jenin, the first large Arab population center in the West Bank. It was terrible here. The Yitzhak Rabin, people said he's a traitor. He was he's he's making some kind of fair cooperation with the, with the, with the Palestinian people, with Yasser Arafat. In spite of the opposition, Rabin holds a huge peace rally 10 days later in Tel Aviv's King of Israel Square. As Rabin departs from the rally, an assailant approaches from behind. By the time the Shinbet can react, it's too late. Rabin is dead. It is assumed the assassin is an Arab. 
but it soon becomes clear that he is a fellow Jew. Yigal Amir claims he was acting upon God's orders to prevent the land of Israel from being turned over to the Palestinians. We knew that this man who killed Rabin was not killing just Rabin, but killed the way that Rabin was leading us as a nation. The way that Rabin was leading the Middle East here for a peace. As world leaders gather to pay their last respects, Shimon Peres is named the new acting prime minister and pledges to continue the peace process. After Rabin was assassinated, the people here feel so bad that Prime Minister Peres decided to make the people not just happy, but to, to feel, to give again the confidence in the peace process. And they ask the security service, please do it. You know, Wazir Hayash kill him. The orders are clear. The engineer is to be targeted for death. We knew that he is in Gaza. In Gaza, we were very close to him, I think, twice. And he escaped. His wife used to go to him, but we didn't know when and how. It's very difficult to follow anyone in the Palestinian area for a long time to be without being noticed. Yasser Arafat and the Palestinian Authority refused to cooperate with the Shin Bet in the hunt. The Israelis say that uh, the man known as uh, Yahya Ayash is in Gaza and that he is... Not, uh, not sure, not sure. Arafat came to that time to a conclusion that if, you, if he won't arrest and do something against Hamas, so they're going to eat him. I mean, they're going to... Uh, destroy him. With no help from the Palestinian Authority, the Shin Bet turns to a special unit called the Mistra Ravim. The Mistra Ravim are trained to talk, look, and act like Arabs in order to penetrate the inner circles of Palestinian society and Hamas. We have a few uh, special units which are professional on uh, going uh, and uh, arresting people at the Palestinian area. Uh, they are very uh, brave. Uh, fighters, and uh, very well trained. The Mistra Ravim concentrate their manhunt in Gaza, where they learn Ayash's wife is pregnant with their second child. They knew that he was living in a house, in an apartment, in Beit Hanun area in Gaza Strip. One of his friends that was with him since the university, Osama Hamad, was living with him, giving him all the help, and giving him one of the rooms to live Osama's uncle owns the house and allows Ayash to live in one of the rooms. When the Shin Bet learns of the engineer's new address, the name of the landlord starts to ring bells. The uncle, Kamal Hamad, was a very big constructor in Israel, very known figure. It is a stroke of luck for the Shin Bet. Uncle Kamal had been a low-level informant for them for a number of years. You need somebody with a good motivation, if it's money, work. In need of cash, informant Kamal finds himself back in the pockets of the Shin Bet. Yeah, hundreds of soldiers or uh, policemen can do what a small piece of information does. The Shin Bet will use their informant to get to the engineer. After three long years, they are within arm's reach of the most notorious terrorist Israel has ever faced. After three years of near misses, an informant has placed Israel's most wanted terrorist, the engineer, within targeting range of the feared Shin Bet. The operation will mark a profound change in the way Israel deals with its enemies. The offensive activity, the Israeli calls targeted killings, uh, and basically it's uh, trying to uh, eliminate one of the terrorists they see not what this person did in the past. The most important thing, what he is going to do in the future. We decided to kill Yehi Ayaz because of his terror activity. If we wouldn't kill him, he will continue to kill Israelis. The assassination is officially sanctioned by the Israeli government. The Shin Bet cannot assassinate without getting permission from the political level. 
from the Prime Minister, from the Defence Minister. We don't intend to live with terror forever. And we shall take all the necessary steps and measures to stop it. December 1995. Shin Bet informant Kamal Hamad reveals that Ayash changes cell phones regularly for fear that conversations with his family are being tracked. Based on this information, the Shin Bet mounts their operation. Using an ordinary cell phone, they begin building a device that will be as deadly as anything constructed by the engineer himself. To build the explosive, it's very easy. This is the battery. Half of the battery can be a dynamite. And you are putting here half of it built dynamite, half of, half, of, half of it it's battery, and you have here everything. You have the electricity inside, so you can use it as a bomb. And not just as a bomb, but a bomb that when it's, it's going to be explosed when you are putting it near your head. And when you are putting it in your head and it's explosed just here into your ear, so you're going to be killed very quickly. With assembly of the bomb complete, the Shin Bet plans for its delivery. They need somebody to give the, 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 the telephone to Yeshi Ayash on one hand and to help to disconnect the regular telephone the, the, in, in the house where he was. The Shin Bet will use their informant to deliver the bomb. So without knowing what he's doing, he was asked by the Israeli security service, please take the telephone give it to Yeshi Ayash. Believing that the phone will only be used to monitor Ayash's conversations, Kamal agrees to deliver the phone to the engineer. From their base outside Gaza, the Shin Bet waits for their target to receive a call. January 5th, 1996. Ayasha wakes to a ringing phone. And, of course, on this Friday morning, the regular telephone was unconnected. And the minute that he started to talk, and his father said, Hello, Yechia. He said, Yes, father. He said, Hello, hello. The Shin Bet confirms the voice of their target. You heard the conversation, and you push the button. As designed, the bomb's sophisticated mechanism had exploded through Ayasha's ear and into his brain. And that was the end of Yehi Ayash. The symbol was killed. And when he was killed, everybody knew in Israel that that's a revenge of a man who killed so many people in Israel. The Hamas master terrorist Abu Ayash, known as the engineer, was reported killed this morning in an alleged bomb blast inside a house. In the West Bank village of Rafat, the engineer's family learns that their son is dead. The Israeli army descends on their home. As expected, their belongings are removed. The house is sealed. And in a widely publicized moment, their home destroyed. I wish, I wish I was a director in this case. It was a brilliant operation. I'm very proud in our uh, intelligence uh, branches who can, who are working very tight with us, very tight. And uh, I think uh, we create very good cooperation. At the end of his terrorist campaign, the engineer was responsible for the deaths of more than 100 men, women, and children, and had impacted the course of Israeli-Palestinian peace efforts. If we could kill Yechi Ayash two years before, a lot of people were alive till today. While the Israelis take comfort in the engineer's death, the Palestinians mourn the assassination of their beloved hero. Ikea Ayash.
الشهيد المهندس يحيى عياش In confronting its own enemies, America looks to the Israelis for inspiration. The Israeli targeted assassination program is uh, certainly one of the most infamous in the world, and I know that American uh, military forces uh, uh, admire the efficiency and skill of Israeli commandos and intelligence operatives who manage to find the people they're looking for and target them. I know that the United States understand it, and they think the same way that we think. Just after 9-11, hours after the attack, President Bush publicly sta stated, and I quote, we are going to hunt them. I don't know any other explanation of the, of the term hunt if not targeted killings. But by targeting Ayash for death, the Israelis may have entered a point of no return. If you attack a terrorist organization, you immediately raise uh, the motivation of this organization to retaliate again against you and to attack you. The minute that Yahya Yash was assassinated, the Hamas decided to make a big revenge. And the revenge came here in Israel. I'm sorry to say that his legacy was to kill, to kill, and to kill. Since 1996 and the consequent collapse of the peace process, the use of targeted killings has become a standard practice in Israeli counterterrorism. I myself recommended to kill the head members of the Hamas organization, and first of all, Ahmad Yassin and uh, Dr. Mahmoud Zahar. And I'm sure if not now, in, more in a month, in uh, two months, we can uh, assassinate those people. You can succeed one time, twice, three, four times. The 25th, 25th time, people were killed, innocent people were killed. And I think that it's not good, and we need to, to try to find another way. Anytime two uh, opposing parties in a conflict uh, get to the point where they're assassinating each other's leaders, it just tends to lead to further and further acts of terror and, and violence, and it makes it more and more difficult for anybody to step forward and resolve the conflict. We are looking to have, to, to replace the guns in our hand by a flower or a pencil. But so we suffer too much in order to minimize the suffering of our children and our grandchildren, we are enforced to use all these methods in order to achieve our goal. كي يعلم كل جبابرة الصهاينة أنهم لا يساوون شيئا أمام عظمة وعزة إصرارنا وجهادنا. And now we have another revenge and another revenge, a circle of revenge, and till now, that's what we are living today, even today. Next on the History Channel, keep